Good morning. It is August 14th. My name is PK. This is Bookie Monsters. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning. This is each week. Good morning, Mary. Monday, hard to believe the weekend is over and we are off and running to work again. It was fun while it lasted. We definitely enjoy the time off, the time away. Let me get rid of this too while we're at it. Let's jump in. Time's going to go by fast. Um, yes, I had a good weekend. Got some reading done. I read um, Agatha Christie's The ABC Murder. I kind of figured out who it was. Uh, but also my age is uh, playing in my favor. I kind of recall there was a plot that this was. And so um, I was able to say, ah, I think it's this. And then I started uh, a historical mystery of fate worse than death uh, by Dolores Gordon Smith. It's the first in a series set in the 1920s, England. Um, and I am at 49%. So hopefully I can get through that quickly. All right. These are the new releases for this week. And we will start with the mysteries. Oh, only two. Well, this will go quickly. Tell Me What I Am by Una Mannion. Nessa Garvey's sister, Dina, vanished without a trace in Philadelphia in 2004. In all that time, Nessa has never once doubted what her instincts told her. Her sister's ex-husband has gotten away with an unspeakable crime. Nessa's niece, Ruby, is raised by her father, the man Nessa suspects, in rural Vermont on the shores of Lake Champlain. Ruby learns how to hunt, how the plants and trees grow, how to avoid making her father angry. The one question she longs to ask is the one she knows she cannot voice. What really happened to her mother? Over 14 years, 400 miles apart, these two women slowly begin to unearth the family history of insidious power and control that has shaped them both in such different ways. But can they reach each other in time? Thrillerish. Cover looked thrillerish. Family drama. The Trade Off by Sandy Jones. For Stella, deputy editor of The Globe, the choice has always been clear. It doesn't matter how low she has to stoop, getting the best story is what she's built her reputation on. For Jess, The Globe's rookie reporter, the story stops when the truth does, but she knows that the dirty tricks of the tabloids will be hard to overturn. And when a celebrity is hounded by The Globe and pays the ultimate price, Jess wonders just how much Stella and the paper are responsible. Determined to show the world what the tabloid is capable of, Jess will do whatever it takes to uncover the truth, but she needs to watch her back because someone else is prepared to bury it. And the rest of her. The trade-off. I know. I'm thinking we are hitting that lull. A lot start hitting um, in the fall to hit the uh, the big uh, mystery convention, BoucherCon. I don't know which month it's in this year, but that's one possible. All right. Let's see which one. These were the cozies. I remember talking about this one, at least the name. Maybe we just mentioned the name Deadly Doe by Weenark Green. First in the Windy and Darling Mysteries, a bizarre murder turns two unlikely friends detective. In a giant tent in the heart of idyllic rural Trittenshire, Trittenshire, Probably pronounced Smith or something rather. 
Uh, amateur bakers test their bread baking skills in the weekly class. It's a muggy July evening and the heart and the heat's rising, but who's the chancer pushing his luck? Next morning in beautiful Hornet to Honest Tour, Geeky John Wendup <laughs> gets a fishy fright down in the cellar of the village pub. Propped up against the barrel, sporting bread and cash, a stinking rich miser sits dead as a doornail. John's big nose smells murder. That's kind of gross, actually. After John and his trusty drap pack find key clues, he rushes to tell good friend and confidant Wendy May. Meanwhile, the Chancer's done a disappearing act and is chief suspect. Fearing a wrongful arrest and setting a set on nailing the truth, the plucky pair team up as amateur sleuths. Wendy and Darling. T.A. Can our unlikely duel find the fugitive and crack the case? Possibly. Firefly Junction. Movie Night Madness. Book 17. London Lovett. Firefly Junction is back for book number 17 with Movie Night Madness. Sunny Taylor and her boyfriend, Detective Jackson, have big plans for a family farm at her home, Cedar Ridge Inn. A barn plan has been chosen and the site's been cleared. Their dreams are getting closer. But when the usual rift between Jackson and his long-dead ancestor, Edward Beckett, grows wider and more thorny, Sunny finds herself in an impossible situation. How can the three of them ever be happy under the same roof? With her own troubles abounding, Sunny finds herself distracted by the town's latest tragedy. A wealthy and well-known, but not well-liked, land developer is shot during Firefly Junction's annual end-of-summer movie night. Sunny sets aside her personal problems and resolves to find the killer, but solving a murder is never easy when the victim is a has a long list of enemies. And then, starting tomorrow... Yeah. Me either. All right. Deadly Secrets in Juniper Bay by Miranda Rose Barker. Coffee's required. It's Kindle Unlimited and only 59 pages. A uh, novella. Charming town, a famous artist, and mysterious murder, deadly secrets of Juniper Bay. That morning, Sarah paused outside the DuPont Gallery as she passed the shops. A painting caught her eye. Being a massive fan of Spencer Whitaker's work, she immediately recognized the artist's unique style. Sarah had admired Whitaker's even Whitaker even before she moved to Juniper Bay. He was the most famous citizen of this small town. She had driven by his home before, fascinated by the enigmatic artist who now lived as a recluse in an old house near the cliffs. So when just a few days later she hears the bad news, Spencer Whitaker is dead. They say it was murder. It comes as a bloater. Initially perplexed, Sarah, the leader of the Maple Way Mystery Club group, soon realized that she and her friends would have to employ their best knowledge and skills to unravel the mystery surrounding Whitaker's untimely demise. From that moment on, an uphill journey to uncover the truth began. That's a lot in so short a book. Dead to Rights by Tara Benner. Second in Mountain Shadow Mysteries. I like that couch. Green. Welcome to the sleepy town of Mountain Shadow, where there's a medium to maintain your haunted elevator and a cozy coffee shop just around the corner. Carolyn McCrithers is ready for a fresh start. After losing her fiancé and her job back in Chicago, she's determined to fulfill her ghostly aunt's dying wish and restore the historic Mountain Shadows Grand. The trouble is, it's the most haunted hotel in Colorado and Carolyn is flat broke. A gang of hard-to-impress old ladies stands between her and a hefty grant to restore the hotel. Carolyn is determined to win them over, even if it means venturing, volunteering for Piddle Patrol at the town's annual dog show. 
But when Carolyn stumbles upon the dead body of her most outspoken detractor, she becomes the lead suspect in the case. It's only the affection of Mountain Shadow PD's finest, Officer Handsome, that, uh, okay, that keeps Carolyn out of handcuffs. But the clock is ticking for her to identify the real killer and clear her name. Can she solve the case and secure the funds to restore her beloved hotel? Or is her new life in Mountain Shadow destined to end in disaster? I bet she solves it. Cookies, Chamomile, and Corpses by Catherine Bruns. Bruns, Bruns. Only 66 pages. They count everything on this page. Again, another novella related to the Cookies and Chance mysteries. So it's kind of like a 0.5. After her disastrous marriage comes to an end, Sally Muccio decides that she's unlucky in love and returns home with hopes to start a novelty cookie shop. There's only one thing stopping her. Money. Sal's, um, Sal's lovable and all-knowing grandmother agrees to help with the financial situation if Sal will do her one small favor. Find out who killed her sister, Louisa. The police have already deemed Louisa's death an accident, but Grandma Rosa is con unconvinced since a valuable family teapot has disappeared as well. Together with her best friend, Sal sets out to discover the truth, but trouble is brewing and the hunt to find a killer might bring everything crumbling around her. Includes a re recipe for delicious tea biscuits and available only for a little, for a limited time. Uh, nothing to click on on these two. We'll have to check back later. Threats in Florence. Aha, uh -huh, had to check. I do have my cell phone with me so that I can stop the alarm when it goes off. All right, this is also Kindle Unlimited. Threats in Florence by Diane Harmon. When Emmy Award winning, winning chef Danny Rossetti is asked by her longtime mentor to assist with the selection of a new chef teacher for her cooking class at her at her castle, as we all have castles, in Florence, Italy, she has no idea how ill Signora Bruno is. She overrides her sixth sense, which tells her this trip could be dangerous, and agrees to critique the three women Signora Bruno has chosen. Each one of the three women will have to conduct a cooking class and prepare a meal. Danny's job is to assess their cooking and teaching skills. At the end of three days, she will recommend to the Signora which one would should be selected as her replacement. That paragraph has a whole bunch of duplication. It could have been shortened. That's just me. Then an email arrives from the Signora informing Danny that all three women have received threats that they should not attend the class, but all of them ignore the threats. Who made the threats and why is a, and why is a mystery. It could even be one of the three women hoping to get rid of her competition for the position. Even so, each one of them is terribly afraid that someone will make good on their threat. Danny has no choice but to help her mentor before it's too late, but she's not sure whether being too late will be for the th whether being too late will be for the three chefs, her mentor, or herself. She and Arthur, her sous chef, have no choice but to oversee the classes and find out just how serious the threats are. Nice setting, though. At the fair in the novellas, does that indicate that the business can't find enough full-length books? It could be, it could be a lot of things. It could be um, the author is just floating some ideas. Here's a thing, throw it out there in between the big books, make a little bit of money off it that way. Um, or some authors, this is all they've got. They can only write the shorter ones. I don't know. Murder at the library. Here we go. It's the library, Mary. Murder at the Library, a North Dakota library mystery. North Dakota by Ellen Jacobson. First in the series, libraries are full of books and deadly secrets. When Thea Olson agreed to volunteer at her local library, she anticipated shelving books, not stumbling across a dead body. Concerned her brother, the acting chief of police, is in over his head, Thea is determined to find out who done it. I bet it's a little brother because 
that's just little brothers can't do anything. She investigates the murder with the assistance of her grandmother and the handsome new library director. Just when the trio of amateur sleuths hits a dead end, a snarky chameleon appears in the library and cryptic clues with cryptic clues for Thea. At first she thinks she's hallucinating, but once Thea accepts the fact that the obnoxious reptile is real, she realizes he might just help her crack the case. Can Thea discover who the murderer is before someone else is taken out of circulation? They had me until there. And quite prominently on the cover too. They had me. And then they lost me. Oh, well. There's mysteries for everybody. <laughs> exactly. Grave Suspicions by Alice James. Looks a little Halloween-y. Book three of the Lavington Windsor Mysteries. Agatha Raisin meets Sookie Stackhouse with demons, vampires, and bad boyfriends. Well, they lost me with vampires. I don't do them. But let's read about it. She's back. She's hungover. She's got no idea. A state agent by day, necromancer by night, reluctant amateur sleuth when bullied into it, Tony Windsor is already juggling life, and now she has to find out who clubbed a Cornish cheese millionaire to death while he was alone in a locked room. And her diary was already full. She's trying to keep the peace between vampire courts, a fistful of demonic contracts have just landed on her lap, and no surprise, her love life still isn't looking great, even though she's finally dating someone who isn't dead. Can't a girl catch a break? No. No, a girl cannot catch a brick. Shocked by Champagne. By Lucy Lakestone, sixth in the Bohemia Bartender's Mysteries. Fatally fizzy. The holidays in Bohemia sparkle with fun under the palm trees, even if mixologist Pepper Ravel and her Bohemia bartender friends are working their glasses off. <laughs> with all the cocktailians in town, the season promises to be festive, at least until a murky death in the swamp puts one of their friends under suspicion. Rumor has it the victim was on the verge of a fantastic discovery, but Pepper and her would-be boyfriend Neil find nothing but questions surrounding it. What was she looking for among the alligators, and was it a motive for murder? While Pepper and Neil search for answers and try to date among the disasters, Pepper's dog Astra snubs distiller Mark's impudent pup, and her ex, Mr. Mixie, gets into more trouble than he's worth. When Pepper gets too close to the truth, will she become blasted like a cork from a bottle of bubbly? I love to end on a question. Yeah, that's not a stretch I want to make. Bartenders. Oh, yeah, there's there's those out there, too. They've got cozies for everything. Kate Martin, Body Under the Cafe. Viking Witch, number 10. Ingrid Thorfredotter. I can say that because I'm Norwegian. Lives in two worlds at once. The first, Rund, lies on the banks of Lake Superior, a town of northern Minnesotans who descend from Scandinavian immigrants, fishermen, and farmers, both. In that world, she barely exists, just as unknown aspiring book illustrator who occasionally sells a little art at the local cafe. The other, Vilmark, lies hidden from the rest of the world by ancient strong magic. The people of the village descend from colonists who fled their homeland in Norway centuries before. In that world, she bears great responsibilities. As a vulva, a Viking witch, the protection of her people always comes first in her life. These two worlds overlap in just one place, her grandmother's Mead Hall. After sitting aban abandoned for months, Ingrid and her grandmother open it again to much celebration in both communities. Then everything goes wrong. See, don't open things like that. The illusions and protections remain despite their efforts at the end of the night, and Ingrid can't get back to Vilmark. Then someone dies, a murder. 
as if Ingrid didn't have enough on her plate. Oh, now I'm somewhat intrigued. I'm half Norwegian. My, um, whoops, my dad's side. My dad used to call me Veslienta, and my grandmother used to speak Norwegian at us. And that's my one of my regrets. Uh, I had the opportunity in college to take a Norwegian class, and I didn't. Uh, the Margaret Millar, that's got to be a re-release. And then we will start tomorrow if there's not enough romances. We'll take a sneak peek. Let's take it. We got a couple minutes. Oh, look at that. There's more. There's six of them. Awesome. All right. That will be for tomorrow. All right. I appreciate everybody showing up this morning. Uh, it's Monday. It's hard. So I imagine uh, other than Mary, who I love you so very much, um, you'll be watching this in replay if you want to watch it. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll be back again tomorrow morning at six to look at the romances. And uh, then uh, just to give you an idea of the schedule this week, I am doing sprints uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings at 6.05 Mountain Time, 8.05 Eastern Time. Bring your own book. You can meditate. You can do your hobby, whatever you want to do. It's just time carved out for, for us for two and a half hours. Um, other than that, I hope your, your Monday goes well. For those of you who are retired, congratulations. For the rest of us, cross our fingers. It goes okay. Um, it'll be quieter here in Billings for sure. The uh, air show has moved on. We had uh, the Blue Angels here quite loudly for the last four days. So it'll be kind of strange to be quiet again. But uh, go forth and read. Hope you're reading something that you are enjoying. Because remember, you don't get good person points if you're reading something you're not enjoying. You can always put it down. Doesn't mean it's a bad book. Doesn't mean it's a bad author. It just means it's not the right time. So, you know, like a, a pause. And it's okay to do, to find something that you do like. Because reading is fun. And uh, we do these morning shows to see what's out there, to get ideas of what we might want to read uh, next. And uh, you don't know what's out there until you look at it. So I appreciate it uh, very much that you are showing up. And uh, God bless. Bye-bye.